Hello, and welcome to the 2050 year Celebration on Mars tour. I hope you all had a good, fun cruise out, and I know we gave you a chance to step outside and experience firsthand our extreme atmosphere. But uh, now that you're back inside the dome and the tunnels, we have plenty of activities for you. I think you'll have fun and uh, experience our controlled atmosphere here. And I think the first things you're going to notice over the next couple weeks are our basic systems have been rationalized. And uh, I think it's kind of intuitive. You'll catch on to it pretty fast. In fact, I think well, once you go back home to Earth, that you're going to have kind of a friction there of adjusting back to the old archaic ways. Because life here is so simple and uh, intuitive, even our work days are organized and everything seems to come right at hand. So you'll experience that firsthand. Uh, you might say, oh, well, you've colonized a new planet. Of course, you have to have new systems. Everything has to be new. <laughs> but that wasn't really the case. Uh, Actually, it bore out of a tragedy. We had a mid-air collision over Mystery Mounds Dome, and this is what led to our standardization. This is the future history story of the standardization of systems on Mars. So in the winter of 2048, we had a scheduled American passenger plane coming into Mystery Mounds, and there was also a scheduled Russian cargo plane that was on a intercept course. And you'd say, how does that happen with all the air traffic control and everything? But there was an impact, and in the collision, there was a mixing of the cargo with, uh, we had sodium that was as a casket of metal, and there was containerized uh, chlorine gas that was compressed. And there was a huge explosion from that that actually rained down on Mystery Mars and broke the dome. So you had all fatalities in there, and then there was many people died on the surface. The Confederation of Mars got together and they said, this can never happen again. We must find out, get down to the root of this problem, and solve this in our basic systems. So they formed, of course, their safety board, investigated this for a couple months, and they came up with five mistakes that were made that day that any one of them possibly might have averted this crash. Um, they passed this information out to all the colonies, and they've consulted their independent scientists, and they got committees together, and they came up with proposals, and they all reassembled as the subdirectorate to investigate this crash and come up with solutions. First up was the Brazilian delegate, and he said that we we see the crash, and we've studied the problem. The first mistake identified was that the Russian co-pilot had typed in their destination coordinates and mistakenly got an E instead of a W. So they were headed for Mystery Mounds, but they got dislocated over here to Comet Crater. And the central computer did not pick this up, uh, put them on a collision course. So we've all had trouble with the alphanumeric Cartesian coordinate system, and we want to simplify this. Here's our proposal. Uh, we go to straight numerals, and there's nine digits that we can have for a latitude. It would work like this. Instead of 360 degrees in a circle, let's expand that out to 1,000 jinks. And if we go down the international date line to the center of Aereo Crater, which is the locator, clear to the South Pole, then that would delineate 500 different latitudes. And then we come back up to the equator, and we go counterclockwise to the east, all the way around, and that's a 1,000 jinks. And that would be all of the longitudes for Mars. And with this simple system, we could have nine digits for a latitude, and nine digits for longitude, and plug those into our GPS, and we could deliver a package anywhere on Mars within a meter of your front door. So this is a complete simplification, and we move that this be adopted by the committee. The sub-directorate 
thought about that, and they voted on it, and they accepted that. So that was one step forward. After that, the Iranian delegate got up, and he said that we have a problem with the time that the American plane had an identified problem, and it had an Earth autopilot still, and we all know that there's 24.7 hours in a Martian day and 687 days in a Martian year. Well, when the pilot had plugged in the destination time on Mystery Mars, Mystery Mounds, sorry, that um, the autopilot sped the plane up to get there at the Earth hour designation. And this was identified as a significant problem. So our solution ties in some up with the Brazilians. We want to go to a fully numeric, uh, comp- it'd be a calendar clock system combined. So in counting numbers, uh, the kids use and things, you start with the day one, year one, century one. And that's simple, but it's not really math. It's not uh, true math that you would use to make calculations. So we want to go to whole numbers. And that's where you start on day zero. Or you could think of it as day zero complete plus. And by doing that, we would translate, say, today's time back on Earth in Seattle. Might be um, March 27th, 2048 year at 1031 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Well, let's simplify that and bring that down. In our new whole number system of a calendar clock, we would say that that would be 2047 colon 085 days point 4286 partial days. And that would be Pacific time in that time zone, but we'd do away with the Uh, daylight savings time. That's ridiculous. (laughs) So this actually syncs up perfectly with the Brazilians' motion. You see, if they have the coordinates in uh, 1000, Jinx, and say you were here in the two time zone, and it happened to be two partial days on the clock, well, you know intuitively that over here at the four time zone, it's four partial days. And so the two work together. And so we propose that this be adopted by the committee. And the subdirectorate thought about that, and it seemed like a harmless proposal, so they adopted that one to deal with the second problem. And then we go to the third problem. The French delegate got up, and he said that we had a problem identified with the American plane had... um, I had loaded up six containers in the back of the plane, and they were clearly manifested as one metric ton weight each. Well, they had logged it in to their calculations as one standard English ton. Now, that's the versus uh, one kilogram, 1,000 kilograms, at 2,205 pounds each versus the standard 2,000 pounds for the English ton. And what this did was put the American plane slightly overweight, and it may have affected their flight controls once the two planes realized they were going to impact. They may not have been able to avoid the collision. So we simply must standardize these weight measurements. Uh, We identified, we've uh, built the metric system on base 10, and it's very scalable up and down. It's easy to learn. It's intuitive. And... We can't have two conflicting weight standards out there. So we move that the whole Mars go to one metric system. And there was little hemming high, and of course the Americans, you have to drag them into it. So they they finally agreed, okay, we can can go that far. And that one was adopted by the board. So going forward, the Russian delegate stood up and he said there was a further problem with the transcription on our coordinate destination. The air traffic controller actually called back the uh, co-pilot and said, 
Now, are you going to Comet Crater? And he said in clear English that we are going there too. Meaning, first we're going to unload at Mystery Mounds, and then our second destination is Comet Crater. Well, the air traffic control computer picked this up as they were going to Comet Crater at 2 p.m. And uh, he said, this is a common problem in English. There are many homonyms and similar words. You have a large, expansive vocabulary. And for that reason, we propose that we go to Russian as the official language of air traffic control. Well, boy, there caused a firestorm there. Uh, the, the American delegate jumped up and he said, now, wait a second. Air traffic control has always been in English as the official language. And there's a reason for that. It's very concise, and it conveys a lot of information in a short amount of time. And so we would resist this. Um, and the Russian delegate said, yes, yes, we assume that. So I have developed a test paragraph here. And we have the proceedings being recorded here by the AI recorder computer. Let's see how it does on this test paragraph. And let me read this off for you. Here he goes. If there are five or fewer misspellings, then we would agree to leave the official uh, flight control language as English. Did you read that Jim wiped the dew off of John's clarinet and gave him two red reeds? I too had read that it was on his to-do list because he had borrowed it and was due to play it soon. Well, you can guess the uh, reaction there from the transcription. It came out 11 either misspelled or completely missing words. And uh, the American delegate kind of shrunk. He goes, oh my God, what did I do? He said, uh, this is hard to come back from. But the assistant delegate jumped up and she said, wait a second, let me have a go at this. I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest on Earth and we have precise diction. <laughs> So she had to go at it, spoke slowly and clearly, and luckily the computer had adaptive learning and was able to pick out more of the words' meanings out of the uh, context of the sentence. So the second time, it uh, came out with four misspellings. And luckily from that, uh, it's still said in some circles that she saved the English language on the space frontier. <laughs> So the Greek delegate got up, and he says, we have a system we've been working on that every exact word, uh, sound, should have one exact phonetic spelling. And there are some homonyms, so we could identify those at the end, but the root of the word should all be spelled the same. So when you see this, you know exactly how to pronounce it. There we go. So uh, the first rule we have is for short vowels, they'd be the short sound you'd type it once. The uh, long vowel sound, you would just double type it. And so like A, A, E, E, I, I, O, O, U, U. So that makes it very simple with the first rule. The second uh, would be that say you had a word and there was the first prime definition that everyone uses. We would just use the precise phonetic spelling there. Then, the second most commonly used definition of that same sound word, we would append a silent theta letter to the end. And instead of that, on the third most commonly definition, uh, we would append a phi Greek letter that's silent on the end. So this would identify that the spelling is correct in the, the middle, but this is the second or third definition. Okay, so this is what it would look like. We call this derivative spelling of English, spacish. And it takes up a little more room, but you know exactly how to pronounce every word. And we think that the computer would be able to pick up the context of this a little easier. And that was considered. So the board went through this. There was some back and forth negotiation, and they finally adopted this proposal. Then the Namibian delegate got up 
And he said, you know, even before this terrible tragedy, we have been working on keyboards. We have many students to educate, and we want something simpler than the old QWERTY keyboard. So this can tie in with the Greek's proposal. Uh, what we've done is put the vowels in the middle row, in the middle, and we put the consonants in alphabetical order on the top and the bottom lines. What this does is uh, it allows syllable sets when you type up and down the keyboard. So it goes da 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 They're very fast motion. Our students have been able to pick this up 15% faster than the old QWERTY keyboard. And they can type it, once they learn it, about 10% faster. The computers are fully programmable as to location of the keys. That's no problem. And this is our solution. You can see that they tacked in the theta and the phi symbols on the right side there. Well, that seemed like a simple fix. And uh, as they said, the computers are programmable, so they voted in favor of that motion. Going forward, then the Chinese. Uh, <laughs> Delegate finally got up and he said the fifth problem identified with this crash was that the um, crew did not know the explosive properties of these commodities. And the handlers, they're not trained in this. There were hazardous stickers on the casks, on the containers, but they didn't know what it would react with. So what we propose is that they be stamped also with this relational wheel of elements so that they get a sense of what elements might react with what. This is pretty straightforward. The center column in the bottom there is the noble gases. And they're very stable. And that's the reason because they have a complete shell of electrons in their outer shell. So they feel comfortable, they're compact, and they don't react much with the other elements. Uh, if we go down the third column, third row down, on the center column there of noble gases, you'll see argon. Argon's used in welding and, and things because it's so inert. Uh, it displaces the oxygen and it's common uh, gas. Well, to the left of that, you'll see uh, sodium. Now, sodium has the characteristic of having one loose electron in the outer shell, and it's very loosely attached. It's uh, quick to bind with other elements. On the right of the center column, you'll see chlorine. And that one needs one electron in the outer shell to feel satisfied and feel complete. They'd both like to be like argon. So you can see the uh, reaction here that when they touch, and there's a little humidity in the air, they immediately collapse into a more stable, compact molecule sharing the one electron and this releases a lot of heat and energy and a big explosion. So that forms sodium chloride or common table salt. If they had seen this, they might have uh, identified the problem and separated those two pieces of cargo. That concluded all of the new standards and we have seen, the economists have studied this since it was implemented. There has actually been a 0.1 percentage point increase in the net GDP annually from these easier standards that uh, make work so much more productive. But more importantly, since the implementation, there have been no mid-air collisions. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>